Good morning and welcome back everyone. Today is Monday, October 9th, 2023. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So welcome everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming back for this morning's Bible study. I pray everyone had a wonderful weekend this weekend, regardless of what you do or did rather. And I pray that we will all have a wonderful day today. Um, for those of you that have been with me, you know that today we're up to Job chapter 19. And for anyone just joining us, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to be reading Job chapter 19 this morning in the Amplified Bible. And then we're going to follow it up with the message. I happen to really like the message um, Bible in this chapter this morning. So I'm excited to get into it. I have some notes and then I have some personal thoughts. You know, my goal is always to see what we can take out of the word of God and how we can apply it to ourselves. Right. And so as I was reading it this morning, first of all, as I was praying in the shower this morning, I said, Lord, you know, really give me a word for the people that I can always be a blessing. That's always my prayer that I will always be a blessing and that this video will always find somebody, right, who needs what it is that the Lord is trying to share. And so I was really just asking God to give me something to say this morning. And as I read this chapter this morning, and really the when I read it for the second time in the Message Bible, it just really, it struck me on such a, a human note this morning. So I'm going to share my thoughts with you, what I think about this from a very human and natural perspective and just things that we can reflect on and, and carry throughout the rest of our days, things that we just need to be mindful of as Job continues to go through um, a season of distress and mourning and having to deal with these um, quote unquote friends who have not been friendly and have brought more misery and not ministry into his life. Good morning, Gigi. All right. So we're going to get into Job chapter 19 and the Amplified. We're going to pray. And then we're going to see what the Lord reveals to each and every one of us this morning. All right. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you so much for waking us up this morning, Lord. I thank you for the gift of October 9th, 2023. Father, we do not take it for granted. So we say good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Lord. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Welcome into our day. Father, we invite you into every area, aspect, element, situation, and circumstance of our lives today, Lord God. Father, may we always fine-tune our ear to hear what you were saying to us, Lord God. May we never fail. May we never faint in our pursuit of you. But Father, may we always push and press into you like never before. Lord, this morning, we lift up our family members. We lift up our bloodlines, Lord, and we pray that you would get a hold of them. And Father, for that point, Everybody around the world, those that are not serving you, those that are lost, those that are brokenhearted, those that are distressed, those that are suicidal. This morning, Father, we come before you on their behalf and we ask God that you would touch them, that you would send somebody across their paths that would speak a word to them. Father, we lift up the school children today. Father, we ask that you continue to keep your hand upon the babies and the children worldwide. Father, may you make a way of divine escape for the children that need to be rescued out of situations and circumstances, Lord, that they should not be in. Father, we pray that you expose everything that needs to be exposed that we can deal with it, that we can pray for it. Oh God, Father, we ask that you release miracle signs and wonders into our lives, into our situations, into our homes. Father, may our homes be havens of peace. Father, may we represent you well in the earth. God, I thank you for each and every person that is on here with me live and those that will watch the replay. Lord, as we prepare to read Job chapter 19 this morning, Father, I pray that you will increase our capacity for wisdom, knowledge, knowledge, revelation, understanding, love. Oh God, may we walk and, and, and display a spirit of love in everything that we do. Father, may we show kindness and may we be the recipients of kindness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, good morning, family. Good to see everyone this morning. 
Um, the weather is changing here in the Northeast. I will say that yesterday I was out. Let me just on a personal note real quick. Um, on a personal note, I was out yesterday morning and the sun was strong and it was hot. It was almost too hot where I had to be outside for the first half of the day where I almost wanted to just get an umbrella to shield myself from the sun because it was so hot. But by two o'clock or three o'clock, it was cool. And you needed a, a jacket or a hoodie to be outside in this morning. I even felt like I could put, although I'm not, I almost felt like I could put my central heat on in the house, but I'm I'm not going to put it on just yet. I see the sun is out now and the house is warming up. But anyway, the weather, I say all of that to say the weather is quickly changing here in the Northeast. All right. I need to go back to Texas. It was hot. <laughs> it was hot in Texas. I had a good time in Texas. It was awesome. I need to go back. All right, let's get into um let's get into Job chapter 19 in the Amplified Bible. We're going to follow it up immediately with the message translation and then I'm going to share my personal human touch thoughts on this chapter. There's a very human element to this chapter. And it just struck me on a personal level because I personally could relate to this. All right? And it reads, then Job answered it. Oh wait, ding ding ding. Job steps into the ring this morning. All right, so Bildad spoke on Friday, right? No surprises there. Job steps into the ring this morning, and here we go. Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment and exasperate me and crush me with words? These ten times you have insulted me. You are not ashamed to wrong me and harden your hearts against me. And if it were true that I have erred, my error would remain with me and I would be conscious of it. If indeed you braggarts vaunt and magnify yourselves over me and prove my disgrace or humiliation to me, know then that God has wronged me and overthrown me and has closed his net around me. I'm glad he called them braggarts, right? Everything is against him. His next section, verse seven. Behold, I cry out violence, but I am not heard. I shout for help, but there is no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass. And he has set darkness upon my paths. He, these are capital H's. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. He has uprooted my hope like a tree. He has also kindled his wrath like a fire against me. And he considers and counts me as one of his adversaries. I wrote this down. I start this verse 11 in my notes. His troops come together and build up their way and siege works against me and camp around my tent. He has put my brothers far from me and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed me and my intimate friends have forgotten me. This is hurtful. Those who live temporarily in my house and my maids consider me a stranger. Rude. I'm a foreigner in their sight. I call to my servant, but he does not answer. I have to implore him with words. <laughs> Excuse me. My breath is repulsive to my wife and I am lonesome, loathsome to my own brothers. Even young children despise me. When I get up, they speak against me. All the men of my council hate me. Those I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh and I have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O oh, you my friends. For the hand of God has touched me. Why do you persecute me as God does? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh or anguish? Job says, my redeemer lives. 23. Oh, that the words I now speak were written. Oh, that they were recorded in a scroll. That with an iron stylus and molten lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my redeemer and vindicator lives. And at the last, he will take his stand upon the earth. Even after my mortal skin is destroyed by death, yet from my immortal flesh will I see God. Verse 25 gets you excited. <laughs> Whom I even I will see for myself and my eyes will see him and not another. My heart faints within me. 
28. If you say, how shall we continue to persecute him and what pretext for a case against him can we find since we claim the root of these afflictions is found in him? Good question. Then beware and be afraid of the sword of divine vengeance for yourselves. For wrathful are the punishments of that sword so that you may know there is judgment. This was an excellent chapter. It, yeah, I love 25, Kimberly. This was excellent from beginning to end. I love the way it opens up and I love the way it concludes. All right, let's jump over to the message. I really like the message translation this morning. All right, Job answers Bildad. I call for help and no one bothers. All right, I'll save, my, uh, I'll save those comments for the end. Job answered, how long are you going to keep battering away at me, pounding me with these harangues? Time after time after time, you jump all over me. Do you have no conscience abusing me like this? Even if I have somehow or another or other gotten off track, what business, it, business is it of yours? Sometimes we need to ask ourselves that question when you start to get into other people's business. What business is it of yours, what they're doing, right? Why do you insist on putting me down, using my troubles as a stick to beat me? Tell it to God. He's the one behind all this. Love that verse. He's the one who dragged me into this mess. He sure did. <laughs> but not because Job sinned, but because Job was blameless. Blameless. He was a good man. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't even get through this chapter. Yes. When I read this, I was like, yes, Job, you nailed it. God got you into this. But for the right reasons, because he was so proud of you. Do you not know? Your friends clearly don't have a clue, but do you not know? We have the privilege of knowing. I love this chapter. Look at me. I shout murder and I'm ignored. I call for help and no one bothers to stop. God threw a barricade across my path. I'm stymied. He turned out all the lights. I'm stuck in the dark. He destroyed my reputation, robbed me of all self-respect. He tore me apart piece by piece. I'm ruined. Then he yanked out hope by the roots. He's angry with me. No, he's not. Oh, how he's angry. No, he's not. He treats me like his worst enemy. He has launched a major campaign against me using every weapon he can think of. Satan is doing that coming at me from all sides at once. Here we go. I know that God lives. 13. God alienated my family from me. Everyone who knows me avoids me. My relatives and friends have all left. House guests forget I ever existed. The servant girl treats me like a deadbeat off the street. Look at me like they've never seen me before. I call my attendant and he ignores me. The nerve, right? ignores me even though I plead with him my wife can't stand to be around me anymore I'm repulsive to my family even street urchins despise me when I come out they taunt and jeer everyone I've ever been close to abhors me my dearest loved ones reject me I'm nothing but a bag of bones my life hangs by a thread oh friends dear friends take pity on me God has come down hard on me do you have to be hard on me too? Job was trying to find an answer everywhere. Absolutely. And everyone turned their backs on him. If only my words were written in a book. Oh, Job, but they are. That's verse 23. Oh, Job. Yes. Facebook's trying to drop because this chapter is so good. There will be no, dis no more disruptions this morning. All right. If only my words were written in a book, better yet chiseled in stone. Still, I know that God lives. The one who gives me back my life. Prophetic. And eventually he'll take his stand on earth and I'll see him even though I get skinned alive. See God myself with my very own eyes. Oh, how I long for that day. You're thinking, how... Can we get through to him? Get him to see that his trouble is his own fault, all his own fault. Forget it. Stop worrying about yourselves. Worry about your own sins and God's coming judgment for judgment is most certainly on the way. And it is. Oh, was this chapter good this morning, family? Oh my gosh, I had no idea. And I told you I accidentally read ahead last week when I put that typo up on Facebook, right? I was supposed to be on um, 
whatever. I, I messed it up. So I read 19. I thought we had read 18, but we read 17. So anyway, I read this last week or listen to it or listen to it. It did not hit me anywhere like it hit me this morning. Nothing. I couldn't even tell you this morning when I opened it up, when I sat down to study this, I didn't even know what was going to happen. I just totally forgot that I read 19. I knew it mentally, but I did not remember not one word out of this chapter. I didn't even remember that this chapter said my redeemer lives. Like this just went out of my mind. So I really started fresh this morning. But this chapter, amazing to me. That's how it's hitting me this morning. I'm excited about it. All right. So I love here. Let's go back over to the Amplified. I love here that it says Job feels insulted and he should. They've done nothing but insult him. Right. And then I love here in verse five, he says, indeed, you braggarts vaunt and magnify yourselves over me and prove my disgrace, my humiliation to me. I really want to know more about these three characters. Eliphaz, Bildad, and um, I forget, right? I really want to know more. Like, I'll have to see if the chapter reveals any more. But like, who are you three to do this to him? Why do you seem to have yourself on this pedestal that I guess you think you're sinless, that you can sit here and do this to Job? I, I, I kind of want to know more about who they are. Were you rich? Were you well-respected? Any of the same attributes? The three stooges, right? These three characters. Um, because like I said last week, God didn't, this chapter is not named Bildad, is not named Eliphaz, it's not named after the three of you. So I want to know. All right. Verse six, I wrote here in the message. Oh yeah. So this is where he says, tell it to God. He's the one behind all this. He's the one who dragged me into this mess. You just love it because it's a, it's a very true statement, but it's just for the right, for the, a different reason It's because he was a man of honor. It was because he was blameless, not because he was this man full of sin. And now God is getting, you know, revenge on him and he's paying him back. Three friends looking at him in a pitiful place or a pitiful state. Yeah. Now this is where this thing hit me so much on a human element, on a personal element. Is that what, is that the word I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Sentiment. Okay. This was very human to me is what I'm trying to say to you. And I think there are things that it caused me to reflect on things that I have seen or witnessed or my own personal feelings about things. Right. So this was very human to me this morning. All right, so then I have verse 11. Um, it's hard to pick this up out of the Amplified the way it's, let me, I'm gonna have to go, I mean, in the message, cause it's grouped. I'm gonna have to pick this up out of um, the Amplified. He has also kindled his wrath like a fire against me and he considers and counts me as one of his a adversaries. So now I say, okay, Job, you got this wrong here. You were right in that God got you into this by, by bragging about you to Satan, but he is not. He is not counting you as one of his adversaries. That's not what is happening here, right? So he goes on and he says that he put these troops against me, all these things, they're sieging against me. Now it gets into family relationships and I'm going to call them employees, right? More betrayal. He has put his brothers far from me. So now your family has turned their back on you, their backs. My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. So even people that you knew on a casual basis no longer want to interact with you. My relatives have failed me. So your family, your bloodline has turned their back and walked away. Your intimate friends have forgotten you. And you have to stop and question why, right? Because I wrote down here when we get down to verse 19, so he's naming all of these things, even the people that lived in his house, even his servants, his maids consider him a stranger. Now, hey, I'm going to take the, and he says, I call to my servant, but he does not answer. I have to implore him with words. I'm going to call these employees, people, you're housing them, you're paying them, I'm assuming, or you're feeding them, whatever, right? They're working for you. So you're giving them something in exchange. The nerve, 
of them not to answer him, the nerve of them to ignore him in his own house. I have to now implore you with words. I call you and you ignore me. He's being ignored from the north, south, east, and west. All everybody around him in his world, everybody's turned their backs on him. It says, my breath is repulsive to my wife. I'm lo loath, I, I'm sorry, my retainer. I'm loath son to my own brothers. Even young children despise me. When I get up, they speak against me. All of the men of my council, they hate me. Those I loved have turned against me. So he's all alone. He still has no one but God to rely on. Absolutely. Right? And sometimes God will cause people to, to not be available in for certain situations and certain circumstances. They'll call, you know, people will not pick up the phone. They won't be able to come. And only God is there for you. And only God can get the glory on the other side of it. In the victory, only God can get the glory. You can't say your friend came and showed up. And it's because of your friend or your family that you survived, right? Because you had to walk through that season with God and God alone. So God gets the glory, right? Tough seasons that we have to go through, but the learning um, and the le life lessons that we get from that. Okay, so I just wrote down in my notes, just more betrayal, betrayal after betrayal. Now he's being ignored. Just, now, just think about this on a human element to be ignored, how we feel. When you call somebody, right, and they ignore you, you know good and well they're within the range of hearing. You know good and well that they hear you calling you, calling them, and they pretend not to hear. And then when it's your child, do you ever remember doing that as a child? Your parent called you. Some of us knew better. We didn't even play that game, but there were a lot of children that do that. They hear their parents calling them. You're on the playground. You don't want to stop playing. The street lights have come on. Well, we knew to come in. We didn't even play that when the street lights came on. We came in. But your parents are calling you to come in the house, stop riding the bike, put the skateboard away. But kids act like they don't hear their parents because they want the last five minutes or another 10 minutes to stay outside and play. But it's disrespect. You're being ignored, right? You're ignoring people. All right. So this chapter to me, I'm hearing a lot of betrayal and being ignored. So the hurt that comes from that. Verse 19, all the men of my council hate me. Those I love have turned against me. So did I say this? But so, but I wrote in my notes, here's the sad thing about this. He hasn't done anything wrong to these people. What did he do? He didn't do anything. I don't read, we haven't read in this chapter anywhere where he wronged any of these people named. He did not wrong his servants. He did not stab his brothers in the back. We have not heard that he has been unkind to children. Job is tired of going through stuff and knowing the father. You know, but it's the beautiful, Kimberly, it's the beautiful to me, the back and forth, the flip-flop of emotions, right? Where he he says, my redeemer lives. And in other chapters where he knows that he is, he has these moments where he remembers that he's blameless and he's upright, Right? And that God will show up for him in the end. God is going to show up. But then he, in his moments of weakness, he says these things that, you know, God now treats me as one of his adversaries. So we can't, for me, I pick up, I pick up the constant back and forth. It's kind of like how we have good days and bad days. In our good days, we see things from a positive perspective and other days when we're feeling weak and we're tired and we're beat down and we, we flip. Right. And we start to see things through a different lens. OK, so then we get down to 22. Why do you persecute me as God does? And I just wrote down he's wrong again. God is not persecuting him. Why are you satisfied with my flesh, my anguish? Why are you three clowns or characters rather? Excuse me. Why are you three who are supposed to be my friends? Why are you so happy to watch me suffer? Okay, here we go. I apologize. I didn't mean to call them clowns, characters. I'm going to call them characters. All right, verse 25. Let's go back over to the message because I like the message. Let me see what I can pick up out of here. All right, let's go up a little bit. He says, even if I have somehow or other gotten off track, what business is it of yours why do you insist on putting me down using my troubles as a stick to beat me 
Tell it to God. He's the one behind all this. He's the one who dragged me into this mess. So here's the human element right here. Even if I have somehow or another gotten off track, what, what business is it of yours? And I just kind of wrote down or thought, took a moment to think. Sometimes we do this. We get into other people's business when it really is not our place, right? Our place is to pray, but our place is not to um, beat people down. Is not to um, start start gossiping and making assumptions about why people are in those situations, right? We don't know how people get into certain situations. And I'm sorry, I missed the, the comments here. It makes them feel better about themselves. So that's why I kind of want to know more about these three. Well, what did you have going on in your life? So, you know? So anyway, I just wrote down that um, you don't really know why people do certain things, do we? The pain that people say things out of pain, they say things out of their hurt, out of their rejection. Some people say things for attention, they do things for attention because they're in such a desperate place and then we can see it as outsiders looking at it and instead of even beginning to question, you know what, well, why? That's not her normal character. Why would she say something like that, right? They're jealous of Job. That, that's been my thought. That has really been jealousy. Um, and that just goes to, to um, make us be very careful about people who come into our lives and people who attach themselves. Have you ever met somebody and right away they want to attach themselves to you and you really don't know why? They're all in, right? Trying to be your friend. They want to come to your house. They want to go to lunch. They're on the phone. They're texting you. And you're wondering who sent you and why are you trying to get so close to me? Like to me, there's a progression with relationships, right? But when somebody comes into your life, a stranger appears and they want to get close to you quickly. You know, I, I, I question things like that. What, why, who, who sent you and what's the rush? Let the relationship grow organically. Let it take its time. But when you start to try to attach yourself to me too quickly and you become overwhelming, I have to wonder about this. So we pray and ask God to reveal the hidden motives and agendas of people who come into our lives. Who sent you? Why are you here? I didn't have that level of discernment in my youth to ask God, who, why are they here? Who sent them? What's the purpose for them being in my life? Do they deserve access? Should they have access or is this access denied, right? Allowing the wrong person in your life can cause you years of misery, heartbreak, setbacks, and you spend decades trying to recover one person. That's what my pastor said. It only takes one person to come into your life and get your whole life going in the wrong direction. You tend to back up. Yeah, because it's overwhelming when people just kind of bombard you and they just want to be in your life. They just want to know everything about you. They want to attach themselves to you. Yeah, I'm like, not so fast, right? I don't allow everybody to come in my home. You can't just come to my house. You can't just show up at my doorstep and invite yourself over. No. Okay. So all of these people, they they are they've turned their back on him. They've disassociated themselves with him. They're ignoring him. The ultimate disrespect, especially when you live in my home and I'm paying, I'm paying you. You work for me, or I'm taking care of you. You're living in my home. I consider you consider you a lot of times a part of my household, and this is what you do. I've not done anything wrong to you. I'm afflicted. You know he's got these sores and everything like that. But this is where it starts to get human and real to me, right? He says, my wife can't even stand the smell of my breath anymore. And again, I said in the beginning, I thought with all of these sores and the oozing and the pussing and all of that, um, I just thought at some point it had to stink. It had to, right? That's my thought. Just based on my, my experiences in life, right? Now, as a young girl in middle school, I used to dance. My friends and I had this little dance group. And one of the things that we had to do was we had to go perform for a Christmas performance. Um, we went to different places. We went to uh, like a school for 
special needs children. We used to have to go into um, the nursing homes and perform for the elderly. And I remember walking into the nursing home as a 13-year-old. I guess I was 13, 14, no more than that. And I remember looking at the elderly and some of them, they had these sores. They had some of them, they had like blue patches on their face, just like, you know, mold that will grow on your bread, right? And you throw the bread out. They had like patches of, it looked like mold to me. They had mold grown on their skin. They had like a, a lot going on. And honestly, it was grotesque. And I just remembered these sweet old people, they didn't do anything to me. And I wasn't mean to them, but it was hard to stomach. It was hard to look at. And so what happens when you see things that are hard to, to stomach, you do shy away, right? But then I started to think about this and I was even thinking about like, now I, I have gone to physical therapy several times and a lot of times they have amputees in there and you, they have burn victims in there. And so some of them that I have seen, they're burned from head to toe and their faces. You've ever seen, you, you know, you've seen those extreme burn cases, right? These people that were in in um, house fires or the car blew up or whatever, and God spared their lives. They were uh, fortunate enough, blessed enough to live, but they're all disfigured and the skin is right. Anyway, it's hard to look at, you know, if we're honest, some of us are not built for that. Right. But if everybody starts to turn their backs on them because it's hard to look at, can you imagine how they feel? Right. Like I've even been in just a personal note. I've been in physical therapy therapy for the last few weeks and there are a lot of um, amputees in there. There are a lot of I, they appear to be burn victims. And when you're not expecting to see that and you look up and that catches you off guard and you're not prepared, you've not had a chance to brace yourself, it can take your breath away. But now, imagine how they feel if everywhere they go, people turn away. Not because they hate them. And, you know, it do, again, you, it doesn't necessarily mean you're being cruel or saying unkind things. Sometimes children just blurt things out, right? And even some adults do that. But can you imagine being on the receiving end of that, where everywhere you go, people can't stand to, t to look at you. People shy away from you. Your friends don't call anymore, not because they don't like you, not because they don't love you. They haven't adjusted. They can't take your sight. And so people start to withdraw and they start to pull back equals feeling of rejection. But it is rejection. It's not rejection because they hate you, but they really are. It is rejection. They are rejecting you because they can no longer take your physical appearance. Especially if you've not been warned, if you've not been able to me mentally and emotionally prepare. Because here's the honest part about that. When it's somebody that you love, you don't want to see them in that state. Right? So that's hurtful enough. And sometimes you just have to have a moment to be able to collect your own feelings and brace yourself for that. Right? So I just sat here from, from a very um, human perspective this morning. And I just wrote down and I started to reflect on the, all the different times that I've seen people who look like Joe probably looked or smelled like Job smells because, you know, you go into these different homes and there's a smell. There shouldn't be, but there is. Right. You go into the hospital on some of these wards. I remember when my father was in in the hospital and in hospice and you walk in and there's a stench. And you're there to see people that you love, but that doesn't make it any easier. Right. And so I just said, God, my God, you know, put yourself in the position of the people who are like this. And then to remember to be kind. This will mess me up. I really did enjoy this chapter. But then you have to, from the human perspective, you have to just think, right? Like some of these people I see in physical therapy, you know, this is when you say, God, thank you. Thank you, God, that I came out 
10 fingers, 10 toes. You know, thank you, God, for every accident you spared us from. Thank you, God, for this is when you really count your blessings if you stop. This morning, just think about every accident God kept you from. Think about, you know, everything that could have happened. Every day, there's, you know, there, there were car accidents on the on the road every day. Oh, family this morning. I, I, I really, you, I love this chapter, but the human element of this um, is a teachable moment. It's a moment of reflection. So now when I go to physical therapy and I walk in there, because some days I walk in and I feel like it's 90% of the people in there are amputees. And there's, they're the sweetest people, right? And then there's some, like I said, they burn from head to toe. I always try to now, I, I try to make sure that I smile. I always make sure that I, you know, I greet them and I say hello. And in my youth and in my immaturity, I would not have been mean, but I would have looked away. I would have turned away. Shock, horror, whatever, right? But now I suck it up as a mature person and I say, you don't know. I, I, you know, those people that have been burned or, or the amputees, I don't even know the amount of pain they live in every day just trying to manage, right? So can you imagine they're fighting their physical pain every day? They got to manage all of these different, um, they have, what do you, I'm, you know, I'm losing my words this morning, but you know, they have the prosthetics. That's what I'm talking about. The prosthetics. And I have a cousin who has prosthetics and things like that. You don't even know the pain that they go through just surviving when your per your skin has been burnt like that. And you've got to try to clamp on these prosthetics and the aggravation and everything. Who are we to be mean? Who are we not to be great, you know, show grace and mercy? Because thank God it wasn't us. Right? Good morning. Thank God it wasn't us. So anyway, I think this was a great chapter to learn from, just to learn and be kind. And they do smile, right? Every morning when I go into physical therapy and those those people are there working, trying to get regain the use of their limbs, they always do smile. They always speak. I've never had one of those people not say good morning back and smile, regardless of what they're going through, regardless of what how much pain they're in or what it feels like. They are always gracious and they always speak. So that's my, my parting word is to be kind today. We have no right to be arrogant. We have no right to, to sit on our high horses because God has blessed us with more than he has given other, others. Because tomorrow God can take it all away before the end of... Good morning. <laughs> before the end of today... There before the grace of God, right? Everything could be snatched away from us. So who are we to be ignorant? I mean, arrogant. Well, that that too. But who are we to be arrogant? Can't. Can't. You got to have humility. We got to have, show an attitude of gratitude, right? Our whole world could be flipped upside down tomorrow. All these events that happened over the weekend, all these lives lost in all these different countries and earthquakes and flooding, Look at what happened in New York here, what, two weekends ago or whatever with the flooding? Who 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 thought that was going to happen, right? So we, we're seeing things happen all over the world. People's lives are being taken away in the blink of an eye, in the, just like that. So that's my, my, my word today is be kind. Be kind. You don't know what other people are going through. We don't know what battles people are fighting. You know, one more thing. One more, comment and then I'm going to go. So I, m my mother introduced me to her friend earlier in the year. I met my mother's friend like April or May. The woman looked to be in perfect health to me. Very, very nice woman, right? So I got a chance to meet the lady and everything. Spent the day with her. That lady is deceased in October. Gone, right? She looked like she was the picture of health and she is gone. So I say all of that to say, we don't know, right? So we don't know what tomorrow brings. So we pray and um, sow seeds of kindness. That's all I'm going to say is sow seeds of kindness. So this was Job chapter 19 this morning. I absolutely love it. 
Um, I thought it was great. I loved it in the message translation, as I always do. I enjoy the message Bible. But you all have a wonderful day. We're going to be back tomorrow with Joe. Let me, let's take a sneak peek at what's going to happen tomorrow. Zophar. All right. So tomorrow, Zophar steps in the ring. It says, Zophar attacks Job, the second round of more foolery. Here we go tomorrow. Job is, I mean, Zophar is going to step back into the ring. So you all have a wonderful day today. Oh, wow. My condolences. Yeah. Thank you. You know, nicest lady. That's why they call it saving grace. Like Job had it and got everything back, man. You know what? I'm not reading ahead, right? So those of us that have read the book of Job or know anything about the story of Job, we know how the story ends. But I have, and, and I haven't read this book from cover to cover in years, right? Although I know the premise of the story. I'm trying not to read ahead every day so that every day we call this right now a cliffhanger. So each day we come we come on and we read this as a family and we see what's going to happen, right? But some of us, we know the story and we know, um, yeah. And th that's honestly, here you wrote like Job had it and got everything back. This is the reason why I, I, it, I chose this book was because I wanted to read a story of restoration um, just for a personal, on a personal note. But this book has unfolded to me this time like I've never read it before. I've enjoyed this book and maybe it's maturity. I'm not really sure what to attribute it to. But this book of Job hit me this go round like it has never hit me before. And I have enjoyed it um, way more than I ever, ever anticipated. So there was definitely a reason that I chose this book. Grace is more important than physical possessions. It absolutely is. Absolutely. I concur 1000% grace. Yep. So with that family, I'm going to say everyone grace and peace today. Have a wonderful day. Um, join me tomorrow for Job chapter 20. All right. And if you are watching on YouTube, and once again, I ask every morning, I ask all of you, if you have not yet subscribed to my YouTube platform, please do. It is called Allison Vaughn. The platform is Allison Vaughn. If you look over this shoulder at the end of the video, for those of you watching on YouTube, you'll see my profile picture. I ask that you click or tap on my profile picture, subscribe to the platform, help me share the word of God with the world. And if you look over this shoulder at the end of this, I am going to link the next chapter to the book of Job for you so that you can read seamlessly. If you have the time, click on the video card. It'll open up the next chapter and you can continue in this journey with us as we walk through the book of Job. All right. So with that, everyone have a wonderful day today and I can't wait to get back tomorrow so we can hear what um, is going to happen in the next chapter. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Enjoy your day, everyone. Grace and peace. Bye.